Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final event in our series of webinars on corporate criminal liability. I'm Penny Lewis, the Criminal Law Commissioner. Thanks to you all for coming to our hosts, 33 Chancery Lane and Kingsley Napley, and to our panelists. In particular, we're delighted to welcome the Director of Public Prosecutions, Max Hill QC, this afternoon. Like the Serious Fraud Office, the CPS is a non-ministerial department, and as such, it doesn't advocate for changes in the law. However, the Director has kindly agreed to provide the organization's operational perspective about the challenges under the current law and the potential benefits of an expansion of the failure to prevent model for economic crime. He's also kindly agreed to take path, part in our question and answer session, which will follow uh, the brief presentations of our panelists. From our point of view, the willingness of the CPS and indeed the SFO to engage with our project in these public forums is a huge benefit to us, and we're very grateful for it. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, last year, the Law Commission was asked by the government to provide a paper on options to reform the law of corporate criminal liability. We intend to publish that paper at the end of this year. Our terms of reference include looking at the identification principle, the possibility of new corporate failure to prevent offenses, deferred prosecution agreements, and the relationship between the criminal law and the civil law in this context. We must also, <clears throat> excuse me, we must also consider the impact of potential law reform on corporations to avoid placing a disproportionate and costly compliance burden on law-abiding businesses. To this end, the project is a joint criminal law and commercial law project led by Professor Sarah Green the Commercial and Common Law Commissioner, who's also here today, and me, the Criminal Law Commissioner. Our consultation is currently open and it continues until the end of August. We're asking practitioners and commentators in the field, like yourselves, to provide the ideas and the evidence we need for our options paper. To that end, we've published a discussion paper, which includes 13 broad questions, uh, which are also found in our online consultation questionnaire on the Citizen Space website. If you're interested in this area of law, or if you hear something at today's event that takes your interest, please go to that website, enter some brief details, and tell us what you think. The fastest way to all of those links is by simply uh, doing an online search for Law Commission Corporate Criminal Liability, and then you'll be able to click through to the discussion paper and the online consultation tool. We're delighted to have such a distinguished panel today. As this is the final webinar, we've asked our panel to comment on some of the overall issues and some of the points that have been made by previous panelists. One of the central issues in our project and during these webinars has undoubtedly been the possibility of introducing new corporate failure to prevent offenses along the lines of those for failure to prevent bribery and facilitation of tax evasion. So this will be a central feature of today's event. The DPP, who has kindly agreed that we can call him Max on this occasion, and Martin Evans QC will speak broadly in favor of that suggestion. Amanda, Amanda Pinto QC and Catherine Tyler will speak broadly against it. Each will bring their own perspectives. Catherine in particular is going to refer to a possible alternative and something not covered in previous webinars, the approach in the Modern Slavery Act. In the second half of the event, uh, one of our lawyers, David Allen, will put some points that have arisen during these webinars to our panelists. Please also submit your questions using the Q&A box in your Zoom window. Time is limited, so the earlier you get in your question, the more chance that we'll be able to answer it. Actually, I should say the greater chance that we'll, we'll be able to answer it. Uh, tonight's event is being recorded and over 200 people have registered to attend. Now I'll hand over to Robert Kay, the lead lawyer on this project, to say a few more words on the arguments and issues that have been raised so far in this series of webinars. Rob? Rob, you are on mute. Sorry. 
Thank you, Penny. Um, so, this, as, as Penny mentioned, this is the um, uh, seventh, I think, uh, of our um, sessions. We've already discussed quite a wide range of interview of uh, issues. So, for those who are sort of just joining us for the first time or have only dipped in, I'll, I'll sort of talk about some of the issues that have been raised during those and, and what we might hope to discuss in in this one. I suppose the the overarching question that we're looking at in this review is. What are the basic principles that should govern corporate criminal liability? What is it for? Why do we want to see um, companies in uh, the criminal courts? Is criminal law a red herring? If ultimately all the company will ever be required by court to do is to pay a fine, discuss, maybe there are alternatives. But if it is, then what do we lose by using civil or regulatory measures instead? Or is criminal law the only way of sticking companies with the moral opprobrium that we seem as a society to place a premium on? In which case, might we seek to bring into the criminal law alternative measures like monitoring, which are currently only available in the context of regulation and DPAs? After all, there was a time when criminal courts could only fine, imprison or execute natural persons. We, we developed rehabilitative and monitoring sentences for natural persons. Could we do the same for companies? On failure to prevent, is this letting off companies off the hook by allowing them to plead guilty to what appears on the surface to be a negligence offence, a compliance failure? even if they actually had a, a rotten corporate culture from top, or at least near the top to the bottom? Is it, as some commentators seem to suggest, the most we can expect to see implemented, so we should just settle for it? Or is it actually what most accurate, accurately describes how companies engage in misconduct? On DPAs, should they actually be called non-prosecution agreements? DPAs might fuel the apparent unfairness of allowing companies to avoid prosecution while individuals end up in the dark. But might this avoid a situation by, where a company will admit to wrongdoing by a named individual who gets the imprimatur of the court and that, that person subsequently denies everything and perhaps even is cleared? You know, should DPAs be extended to cover individuals associated with the case? Compliance costs, something which we've touched on in principle, but I don't think I've really addressed in, in detail. What would a reformed identification doctrine mean or, or failure to prevent doctrine mean for companies in terms of the, the burden that it places on them? Would it mean expensive, extensive, burdensome procedures to try and prevent misconduct, or at least have the evidence to be able to show, show a court that they'd try to do so in the event of that taking place? And what would reasonable measures or similar look like in relation to a failure to prevent a broad offence like fraud? One can imagine the sort of measures a company might put in place to prevent bribery, training, monitoring, expenditure. But given the variety of ways in which someone within a company might commit fraud for its benefit, how could the government hope to draft the sort of generic guidance that they've done for bribery and tax evasion? And if they don't, are we going to see large companies walking free because they've nicely drafted anti-fraud policies and statements which tick all the right boxes but have little practical effect on their employees' behaviour? So might there be alternative approaches? For instance, as, as we'll discuss later on in this session, the Modern Slavery Act requires large companies to publish a statement on their website of the measures they're taking to tackle slavery and exploitation in their supply chains. Might something like this, a measure based on transparency and accountability, be an alternative approach rather than the big stick of the criminal law? Finally, since we're talking about corporate policies, if I go onto the web, I have no difficulty in finding companies professing to act collectively through the organisation with what looks very much like a series of virtuous mental states. So um, Barclays, for instance, has a corporate um, statement of corporate values that says that they, they are acting with empathy and integrity to be a leader in the banking profession and to engender trust. It doesn't say only the board will act with empathy and integrity. Or well, Serco, um, our culture is based on a set of four values, trust, care, innovation, pride that shape our individual behaviours consistently across our organisation. So, so the way the company behaves is the sum total of the way that individuals behave, that corporate culture apparently exists. Or News International, Passion, curiosity, bravery and optimism permeate our entire organisation from the, the top talent to every member of staff in every function. So again, the entire organisation, not just the directing minds and wills. You know, if big companies can, as they repeatedly profess to do out of court, operate with mental states like honesty, integrity and trust, why is it that the law alone maintains the position that there's no such thing as corporate culture and, and only natural persons within the boardroom are capable of operating as the company? Because what those companies' defence counsel say in court appears to be very different to what their PR departments are telling the world outside. I'll just throw that out there and uh, we welcome any discussion that, that might follow. Back to you, Penny.
Sorry about that. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. Um, I think I'll hand over now to uh, David Allen, who's going to introduce the panel. Uh, thank you, Penny. Uh, yes, our first uh, panelist tonight, our first speaker tonight is Max Hill QC, the Director of Public uh, Prosecutions. Uh, Max Hill is a, the, uh, was previously the head of Red Lion Chambers, the chair of the Criminal Bar Association and leader of the Southeastern Circuit before taking up his current role, as I say, as DPP, the head of the Crown Prosecution Service at uh, Max. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much to the organizers and for this uh, invitation to say a few words to you. Uh, and um, as advertised, I'm happy to stay during the panel. Uh, I know you've had an interesting, I'm sure, uh, thought provoking set of uh, webinars. Um, Crown Prosecution Service very much welcomes and supports the Law Commission's review um, of CCL. It's an important uh, topic. Uh, and just broadening for a moment, tackling economic crime as a whole is, I hope you know, a priority for the CPS. And indeed, we've recently published our first economic crime uh, strategy as a, a declaration of intent in this uh, area. We all know, don't we, the eye-watering statistics in terms of uh, sheer number of frauds and money lost to the national economy. Um, I know during the course of the uh, webinars, you've heard, and some of you on this call will have heard from Andrew Penhale, who's our Chief Crown Prosecutor, head of the Specialist Fraud Division at the CPS. And as uh, Andrew said, we do support uh, the principle of uh, an expansion of the fail to prevent model for wider economic crime. We know we have it uh, for bribery corruption, uh, wider economic crime means fraud, false accounting and money laundering. So at that principled level, that's where, if you like, I would start the conversation. Uh, I think uh, it is undoubtedly the case that current fail to prevent offences uh, have proved an important tool for prosecutors. Uh, we are using that uh, offence to prosecute. But I would say that it's not just about uh, increasing the number of uh, prosecutions. I think what we're discussing tonight is driving better corporate um, behaviour. Um, we know that uh, there have been a relatively small number of Section 7 uh, Bribery Act prosecutions um, that, that we or anyone else has been able to bring. Uh, but I hope we can recognise that the existence of the offence has nonetheless incentivised good corporate uh, governance. So the question is, can we influence that yet further and expand on that? Uh, I know that the uh, preceding events in this series have, have talked about a number of different views. I'm sure they'll be reflected this evening as well on the options for reform. Um, important to say that at the CPS, we recognize that one size may not necessarily fit all uh, when it comes to CCL. Um, different types of uh, offending, different types of offences. Uh, I think we're going to hear this evening probably from Catherine about modern slavery as, a, as an example of a particular crime type uh, now in existence for which corporate bodies can be expected to be uh, actively vigilant to prevent crime. And the administrative approach that's been taken there to hold corporates responsible for modern slavery in their supply chain um, is good as far as it goes, but I know that some would criticise that for lacking teeth, and I know that further reform is being considered to that regime. So interesting to see how that develops uh, this evening. But for economic crime, uh, I repeat, we know that the FTP model does work, so it seems logical to at least discuss an expansion of that model. I'm not talking here about an either or situation, um, but, but I am interested in having the right tools for prosecutors and of course for law enforcement. Um, the senior managers regime I know is something that's featured in your previous discussions and there are some benefits of that, but it only focuses, albeit at the senior management level, on individual accountability so it doesn't address any challenges that many of you may share under the identification principle. And I know a number of 
distinguished previous speakers have addressed those challenges. So what I'm saying is that a, an FTP offence, if expanded, would complement rather than provide an alternative to individual accountability. It's not about, uh, therefore, exonerating the individual and somehow shifting the blame onto the corporate. It's about ensuring that the system as a whole serves the public interest uh, and indeed the public expectation, which surely is that all those involved in uh, committing or enabling economic crime should be held to account. Let me just make two points to demonstrate that I think there is an impetus for at least considering an expansion of the failure to prevent uh, model. First is this, we know that uh, there are serious challenges in the prosecution of corporates, uh, actually for any kind of offence, but for economic crime too. We see that in the non-regulated uh, sector, uh, and I think in the discussion document that the Law Commission has put out, you can see that in some of the uh, case examples where that is demonstrated. Um, but there is clearly an argument that where there is, at a corporate level, a culture of turning a blind eye to fraud, and particularly where the corporate might benefit from that, well, it should be held to account. Hence, as I say, there's some impetus there. There's also more, I suspect, that can be done to tackle these issues in the regulated sector. That uh, brings me to section 330. We note the Law Commission found in, in its review of uh, the anti-money laundering provisions of POCA, um, and specific to this duty to disclose, section 330, quoting the Law Comms paper, junior members of staff bear the burden of responsibility. And they went on to add, it would help to embed the risk-based approach at all levels of the organisation. We all have to live uh, in our various lives, uh, professional lives with a risk-based approach. And I think the question for tonight is why not expand that in the field that we are considering? Uh, I should add that the CPS uh, ourselves recently revised our approach to the Section 330 standalone uh, cases. Um, and so a failure to prevent model could complement that approach. So, for example, where there have been systemic uh, failures to report because individuals were simply following a corporate process, uh, the public interest might surely indicate that the corporate should be held to account. Um, but the evidence uh, at the moment uh, may not be sufficient to attribute liability under the current law with the personal model. So that's the first point. The second point I'd make is that the premise on which the failure to prevent um, tax evasion offence, facilitation of tax evasion offence was created is actually the same as for money laundering and expansion wouldn't do offence to that. And in the consultation document for that offence, the government recognised, and I'll quote, that in the same way that a professional who dishonestly assists a customer to evade tax is guilty of the tax offence in which he or she becomes complicit, the corporation which employs this professional and fails to take reasonable steps to prevent that offending should also face prosecution. So I think uh, that's the second point. What I'm saying is I haven't yet seen a compelling reason not to hold to account a corporate who fails to take reasonable steps to prevent the facilitation of, for example, money laundering. So the premise for the offence is there. Query whether anyone at this meeting will present a compelling reason to say, go no further. Um, in closing, and I'm going to close now, of course, we all have to be alive to the burden that could potentially be placed on corporations. Uh, when, and we're not talking about a strict liability offence here, failure to take reasonable steps, due diligence, guidance to be issued. We can talk about all those sorts of things. We have to take the burden on corporations into account. But I think others in this series have noted that the failure to prevent model does prevent, provide the best model for reform of the law of economic crime. It's, it's well known now, FTP, it's part of our law, and it might help to ensure consistency. Um, but also, we need to be mindful of minim minimising the burden on corporations. And that's the last point I'd make. Uh, provided it's accompanied by guidance, a new offence is unlikely to ask corporates to do very much more than what they would ordinarily be expected to do under the law. 
um, but it would enable prosecutors to hold them to account more effectively if they fail in that duty. And last point, it would enhance public confidence in the criminal justice system. And we're all in our various ways heavily invested in that. So thank you. Those are my thoughts for now. Uh, thank you very much, Max. And let's see if um, Amanda Pinto, our second speaker, will take you up on that challenge to provide the compelling reasons that you describe. Um, Amanda Pinto QC is a member of 33 Chancery Lane. She is the co-author of Pinto and Evans on Corporate Criminal Liability, the fourth edition of which was published in April this year. And she is a contributing editor of Blackstone's Criminal Practice on Corporate Crime. In 2020, she was the chair of the Bar Council and her recent cases include a $700 million fraud by a UK-based hedge fund manager. Amanda. Thank you, and thank you very much to the Law Commission for this series of webinars on corporate criminal liability, which I, for one, have really enjoyed. Well, what is the purpose of further extending corporate criminal liability? I'm all for better corporate behaviour, but I query whether extending failure to prevent will do the trick and fear it will negatively affect businesses and their efforts at compliance and good conduct. There is no doubt that the doctrine of identification is poor at holding to account sizable corporates for crimes. But the answer may be not to add to the statute book, but to use what we already have. Fraud is qualitatively different from bribery, environmental offences or tax evasion. In those areas, there was an international drive to fill a gap and to level playing fields. Fraud which a company fails to prevent covers a huge spectrum of scale and circumstances. It may very well be the victim of the fraud itself. Its shareholders would be doubly penalised if it fails to prevent fraud uh, and is at risk of criminal proceedings. And relying on prosecutorial discretion to say whether something should or should not be prosecuted is simply not a substitute for clear, certain law. We shouldn't forget the 2018 House of Lords Select Committee Report on the Bribery Act 2010, which uh, came to this. Although large companies were putting aside resources for compliance, many uh, small and medium-sized enterprises were unable to do so. The impact assessment of the Bribery Act and its guidance indicated that they were often completely unaware of their change responsibilities and had no prospect of funding legal or compliance help. I am totally against adopting the American model of vicarious liability, which I'm pleased to say doesn't seem to be rearing its head very much in uh, the conversations that we've heard before. I don't believe a person should be convicted of crime if they aren't culpable. But I suggest that greater use of existing crimes and regulation, or what in earlier webinars has been referred to as civil proceedings, may provide a better answer without the need to change the law. If in reality, alternative models exist to penalize errant companies and to remove any criminal benefit from them, there is no need to add to the burden of prosecution agencies and criminal courts, let alone parliamentary time. The FCA has recently been challenged, for example, over its failure to prosecute cases of fraud that are within its remit. Equally, we know that the police and the CPS are very stretched in terms of resources. Britain's biggest police force, the Met, lost two thirds of its dedicated financial officers between the 2007-08 uh, year, when it employed 91 financial officers, to 30 being employed by February of last year, even though fraud was the most reported crime. Their problem isn't corporates acting with impunity because of their identification doctrine. It is lack of resources and understandable different priorities. I suggest the focus should be on the individuals actually doing the criminal conduct and on removing the benefit from corporate vehicles um, or through regulatory sanctions, whether by civil recovery, by pursuing confiscation orders against corporates, for example, who commit easy to prove already existing Companies Act offences, rather than a litany of new ones. Civil recovery orders and account freezing orders already exist to remove criminal proceeds from corporates from small to large. They obviate the need for full blown criminal proceedings, but are frankly underused. Three other observations, if I may. 
Should we worry about the two-pronged approach against individuals and corporates? The fact that one is criminal and the other is regulatory happens now and is not necessarily unacceptable. For example, the market abuse inside of dealing regimes, one being regulatory the, uh, against corporations and the uh, one against individuals being criminal in nature. Uh, and I'm going to leave the modern slavery type approach to Catherine Tyler. But when one thinks about regulatory offences, fines in many instances are unlimited and those imposed by the FCA or, or the Environmental Agency, for example, are often huge. My second last point, as it were, is a plea for consistency. If there are to be changes to the law, please ensure that the tests for corporate liability for failing to prevent crime are aligned. Currently, the test for failing to prevent bribery is different from that for failing to prevent tax evasion or ill treatment or neglect in a care home. That is not in the interests of business or in the interests of the public. What we need is clarity uh, and we need consistency. And my final point in relation to DPAs, if I may, is although it's clear that there is a purpose and attraction to a DPA, it has, uh, it seems to me, had some unforeseen consequences. I believe that they can risk a dissipation of focus from investigation of individuals. They are, of course, more akin to a negotiated settlement than a criminal sanction. And there is almost certainly going to be a disconnect between those who successfully negotiate a DPA and those who don't have the resources to do so. So when one's considering whether it is in the public interest to prosecute a company, for example, or go down the DPA route, it is very often, certainly so far as there has been... A, a Amanda, sorry, can I ask you to, to wrap up there so we've got yep. enough time for our debate? Yep. I think uh, you've made your point on DPAs. I have. So in my opinion, failing to prevent is not the solution. Better use existing legislation is a good start in the right direction. Thank you very much. Our third speaker tonight will be Martin Evans, uh, QC, also a member of 33 Chancery Lane, and he is the other co-author of Pinto and Evans on corporate criminal liability and a contributing er editor of Archbold. His recent cases include appearing for the SFO in the recently reported international corrupt in a recently reported international corruption case and in the Supreme Court in cases involving proprietary claims and confiscation orders. Uh, Martin. So <clears throat> given the shortage of time, I'm just going to concentrate on one aspect of this discussion, uh, and it is the proceeds of crime um, element of it. Section 2A, subsection 4 of the Proceeds of Crime Act indicates that the reduction in cr of crime is in general best secured by means of criminal investigations and criminal proceedings. The trouble is that whatever the merits of the doctrine of identification, its result is that Prosecutions of small companies are not uncommon, but are seldom commenced against medium or large sized companies. As Professor Gobert observed some years ago, one of the prime ironies of Tesco and Latras is that it propounds a theory of corporate liability, which works best in cases where it's needed least and works least in cases where it's needed most. It's of course axiomatic that economic crimes are committed for benefit many acquisitive offences are committed within a corporate context. Whilst the individual who commits the substantive offence may stand to profit from the crime, for example, by an enhanced bonus or the maintenance of a salary, the true beneficiary of the offending will often be the company. Bribery is a prime, but by no means the only example. But back in 1996, Lord Justice Rose observed in a case called re -H, but there'd often be no useful purpose served by prosecuting the company given the additional complexities as to the corporate mind and will which charging the company will involve. And that appeared for many years to become the default setting for prosecutors. Problem is though that if a company is not prosecuted, or I should say not convicted, as the case of Boyle Transport demonstrates, the benefit that the company obtains cannot be confiscated. So where a company is used to conceal the involvement of a true actor, of the true actors, the crooks, and is used to hold property for them, then there's no problem. 
uh, but many cases involve real companies otherwise engaged in lawful business, where the company's assets certainly cannot be treated as belonging to the human defendant. Take a bribery case. Assume that the employee offers a bribe to secure contracts for his or her employer, company A. The bribe does the trick, the contract awarded to company A. The contract keeps company A afloat and the employee in a job. The employee is convicted of section one bribery. The benefit will be what he or she actually obtained as a result of or in connection with the offence, which would certainly not include the contract price. Company A is not prosecuted for the section one offence because the employee is not the, the direct in mind and will of the company, but is convicted of a section seven offence. Confiscation proceedings against the company follow. It's at least arguable that what the company obtained as a result or in connection with its failure to prevent bribery was the contract price. But if you now substitute fraud for bribery, there is of course currently no FTP offence relating to fraud. So if the company benefits from the crime but cannot be convicted, it's immune from the risk of a confiscation order. Now, the Supreme Court has said that the overall aim of POCA is to recover assets acquired through criminal activity both because it's wrong for criminals to retain the proceeds of crime, and in order to show that crime does not pay. And that was Lord Tulson in Armad, paragraph 38. It's certainly at least arguable that wider application of the FTP model to other economic, uh, other economic crime would uh, support that aim. And it seems to me consist be consistent with that observation right at the beginning of section of the act in section two, that the reduction of crime is in general best secured by means of criminal investigations. And if there can't be uh, prosecutions and convictions of corporates that obtain a benefit, uh, then that's hardly going to help in the reduction of crime. Martin, thank you very much. Let me uh, stop you there. I think you've made that point uh, very well and uh, we need to make up some time. So let me introduce now our fourth speaker, please, Catherine Tyler. Uh, Catherine Tyler is a partner at Kingsley Napley in the criminal litigation team and a specialist in issues concerning modern slavery uh, and business and human rights. Her recent work includes acting in a high profile multi jurisdictional review of a leading charity's involvement in human rights abuses. Uh, Catherine. Thanks very much, David. So I'm aware of the time pressure, so I'm going to go straight in with Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, which requires relevant commercial organisations with a total turnover of £36 million a year or more to prepare an annual slavery and human trafficking statement. These statements have to include either details of the steps the organisation has taken to ensure that slavery and human trafficking is not taking place in any of its supply chains, or a statement that the organisation has taken no such steps. The Act sets out what the statement may include and is elaborated on by statutory guidance. It has to be approved by the Board of Directors or equivalent and must be signed by a director or equivalent. It has to be published on the organisation's website or provided on request. And it touches relevant companies wherever incorporated, which surpass the financial threshold and which carry on a business or part of a business in any part of the United Kingdom. So the question is, is this an example of the way in which the regulation of corporate governance can be used as a crime fighting tool in situations where there's likely to be an absence of sufficient prosecutions, however the identification principle is framed? Section 54 is unique and distinct from all other regulatory models as it relies exclusively on civil society pressure for its enforcement, with one caveat. It provides for the possibility of an injunction to be applied for by the Secretary of State to require a company to comply with the reporting requirement. This mechanism has never been used. Predictably, this lack of enforcement led to complaints from both civil society and business, from the latter that it leads to an unequal playing field and lack of legal certainty as to what's expected. Furthermore, as Section 54 isn't integrated into reporting obligations under the Companies Act, there's no scrutiny from the FRC in respect of the adequacy of any of the disclosures. Plainly, this would be a logical focus, particularly insofar as unstable supply chains can have a material impact on business. Against a backdrop of criticisms, the government have now committed to backing some kind of state-based enforcement of the Section 54 obligations, but proposal of these reforms are incomplete. What is not clear is whether these reforms will lead to any qualitative review of the modern slavery statements themselves and what they disclose, or whether they'll simply monitor the failure or otherwise of a qualifying company to complete a report, whatever that report says, 
which might be that it took no steps to monitor modern slavery in its supply chain. Failure to properly follow up on the Modern Slavery Act consultations is a missed opportunity for the government, as in my view, corporate governance obligations of this kind can be effective, practical and politically palatable and will soon become irresistible. In its current form, the simple fact of a modern slavery statement is a deeply unsatisfactory solution to preventing the harm in question, while simultaneously penalising those companies that want to do the right thing. That said, the idea of a statement or some kind of public reporting on these kinds of harms is a good one. We see it um, to an extent in the strategic report regime under the Companies Act and in proposals for the Environment Bill. A publicly available statement submitted annually is a step beyond the anti-bribery statement or procedures which are kept internal. For the kind of overseas harm that Section 54 aims to prevent and is often committed at the end of global supply chains, domestic measures which mandate scrutiny of and reporting in respect of extraterritorial conduct without an overt infringement of sovereignty are also an effective way of improving corporate conduct abroad and requiring companies to take proper notice of their impacts. They level up the playing field for business and make competition fairer. The true effect of these kinds of reporting obligations will be tested internationally, if not at home, over the course of the next few years. The past few years have seen a proliferation of mandatory human rights due diligence laws at the European level and internationally, which broadly speaking require companies to conduct and report on due diligence procedures in the context of human rights and occasionally environmental harm. Jeremy Horder, speaking at the third of these sessions on failure to prevent, talked about political pressure and there being a right moment for legislative change. I would say that this is the best focus of such pressure at the moment, not amendments to economic crime offences. This pressure is led not only by civil society, but also by business, the former looking for legal certainty, a level playing field and a harmonised and non-negotiable standard, which facilitates leverage in the supply chain. I've seen David. I've got three points I'd like to make in relation to the extension of FTP for wider economic crimes, which I will make very quickly. Firstly, that given the diversity of ways in which some of the identified economic offences can be committed, an FTP offence would be unworkable because the adequate procedures would either be so granular as to be impractical or so high level as to be meaningless. Given the limited resources, we have to be practical and ask if the aim is to improve corporate governance in order to preserve the financial integrity of UK businesses, is this the most effective way of achieving it? Or is it to use what we have and develop and toughen up financial regulatory measures that are in place already? Is there the political will in relation to these economic offences? I would say no, not when compared with the pressure that we see internationally in relation to other conduct of the kind that typifies some of the corporate malpractice and strikes at the heart of some of the threats we face now, specifically environmental harms, human rights violations and modern slavery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Well, if I can invite all our four panellists, please, to put their cameras on and their microphones on, and we'll move to the, uh, the second part of the event, which is the uh, debate. And perhaps, perhaps I, I, can, I start. can start. Oh, I see oh, you've I got, see some, you've got uh, some, uh, echo. some echo. Never mind. Never mind. It's it's it. Okay. okay. We'll, 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 do my best. Do my... Um, Max and Martin, Martin um, um, how can we how justify, can we justify treating, treating fraud, fraud more, more seriously, seriously than, than modern slavery, slavery when it comes, when it comes to a company's, to a company's obligations? obligations. I can... Sorry, Dave, did you did you cut out or had you finished? I, I didn't mean. I, I didn't mean I didn't to. Mean someone, to. someone, if anyone's got some headphones, they can put in. It will stop, it will stop this echo that we're hearing. Okay. hearing. okay. Or perhaps, or perhaps it's better. Yes, you can put your mic on until you're going to speak. Tell you what. Tell you what. See if, that, See if helps. that helps. Nope, nope. So, I, I mean, I think I got the gist of your question, and I'm Thank sure you. Martin will, will come in as well. Are, are, are we at danger of treating fraud uh, more seriously than modern slavery? Well, um, clearly, uh, in one sense, there's nothing more serious than modern slavery because it impedes the right of an individual to live life as they would. But I, I think we've got to be careful what we're comparing here. The argument in favour of interceding more effectively against fraud is made by the extraordinary prevalence of fraudulent activity, uh, the millions of cases, the billions of pounds. Modern slavery is of a totally different magnitude, very serious in its own way, but utterly different. So I would rephrase your question. Given that we are interceding against economic crime and econo economic uh, fr fraudulent activity, at one level and using a statutory model, why aren't we doing it in relation to uh, another level or other levels of criminal activity? So having started with failure to prevent in the first place, why not expand it? So the answer to your question may be, um, 
if it was right not to intercede at all, you'd have a modern slavery uh, model, which Catherine's told us about, and you'd have nothing of the sort leaning towards the corporate activity in any element of economic crime. But we, we're past that point. So I think the debate for tonight is already being past that point. Have we got the tools that we need? Are there greater steps that we could take um, with care, um, difficult though that is? That's but is that the point then? We've sort of opened the door uh, an inch in terms of two kinds of offences, bribery and uh, facilitation of tax evasion. But we're talking about pushing it open to fraud, money laundering, false accounting. And the argument becomes then, well, why stop there? What about modern slavery? What about theft? What about a failure to prevent another person committing a criminal offence is going to become a criminal offence? We adopt that widely. Well, again, and you know, Martin, do, do, do come in. I don't, want to, I don't want to hog the discussion. Um, we are driving against a particular area of criminality here. I, I don't think it works to say, let's use this to intercede against other levels of offencing under the uh, offences under the Theft Act or other levels of, um, of uh, acts of omission um, on the part of corporates. We know what the target is in front of us. It's the extraordinary incidence of the particular aspects of economic activity which are draining the national economy. If we don't have the tools that we need, we should put those tools in place. We can, of course, limit that appropriately. It doesn't mean that we're suddenly introducing um, crimes of omission right across the canon of criminal offending, where uh, it remains uh, rare. All right, well, let me uh, pass to a question uh, to Amanda and, and Catherine then. I mean, the introduction of the Bribery Act, which I suppose is part of the background to this, was met with concern uh, at the time before 2010, but it appears to have resulted in a positive change in corporate culture. Now, why don't we seek to achieve that and build on the success of the Bribery Act more widely by what is suggested, expanding these successful failing to prevent offences? Well, if, if I may go first, I'm not quite sure what the... Um conclusion that uh, we've impro improved corporate behaviour through the Bribery Act is. I'm not sure how you've measured that or, or how you can come to that conclusion in, in a meaningful way. Well, we, we haven't measured it, but a lot of people tell us that. That appears to be the consensus. You, you tell us if we're wrong. Well, all I'm saying is that I think the uh, House of Lords Select Committee report was clear. The evidence that it gathered was that actually there was a lot of um, changes of compliance procedures in big companies, it was a much more mixed picture for SMEs. Um, and I think that's really the point that I was trying to get across a bit earlier, was um, I, I'm not um, against failing to prevent if it's going to improve corporate behaviour. I'm not sure that it does. And, and actually what worries me is that there will be so much burden on business that it will actually limit business rather than keeping it going. I don't know whether Catherine's got uh, a specific view following on. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, kind of following on from what Amanda says, it's not the case that we're kind of against the failure to prevent model per se, but um, that it obviously has to be exercised judicially with a view to the, kind of the purpose of its specific implementation. And I think there are problems with the economic offences, the diversity of those offences being so broad, um, as to require kind of very careful consideration as how to actually practically it could be implemented, particularly where there are resource difficulties. Um, and we have to be careful about how we direct those. Let me put a, another question uh, to uh, Amanda and Catherine. And uh, Martin made the point that if uh, individuals are prosecuted, but the company isn't prosecuted, then you don't have the facility to seek a confiscation order for the company. And there may be circumstances where an individual commits a fraud from which a company has benefited but without a conviction of that company, um, it risks retaining some of the benefits of that fraud. Yeah, so I, I think what I was, um, I, I mean, that's obviously an issue and it, it's not one from which I'd like to resile. I think it's a really important point. But the question isn't really then about corporate wrongdoing. It's about removing benefit. And what you can do, it seems to me, is... Um, either beef up regulation if it isn't already there in the Companies Act or elsewhere, 
uh, to ensure that actually what you're really trying to do, which is to remove benefit and make it less attractive for business to behave in that way, uh, as, as a, a, a palpable business expense it cannot afford to have, it seems to me that there are just much more simple ways than a criminal conviction and all of the hoops that have to be gone through for that and the time and resource because uh, no doubt the Crown Prosecution Service Serious Fraud Office have got very significant restrictions on resources generally and what one wants to do uh, in limiting uh, corporates from getting ill-gotten gains is to do it as uh, quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, Martin perhaps I can uh, make a point on that Bribery is an offence which is often committed in jurisdictions where there may not be the same uh, rule of law and sophisticated legal structures, but fraud is, well, most fraud offences, I would imagine, by number are committed within the UK where the people being defrauded have access to legal redress against the perpetrators. We take the Serco and G4S cases recently, the two DPAs there, both fraud cases, both companies agreed substantial payments but those payments were dwarfed by the payments they'd already agreed with their customer, the Ministry of Justice, six years previously. The companies were already deprived of their benefit and more under the civil law. Okay, I was waiting for the question. <laughs> there are two things to remember. One is that, is that prosecutions um, play an, have an important declaratory effect. It's important that companies aren't regarded, particularly medium and large size companies aren't regarded as, uh, as immune from prosecution and immune from confiscation orders. And, and part of that declaratory effect is that they are, generally speaking, um, or at any rate, frequently widely publicised. And, and that, I think, in, um, enhances the, the um, uh, public perception of the rule of law, which is important at any, at any time, particularly as companies play a, an increasingly important part in society. So there's, so there's the declaratory aspect of it, and it's not merely, and, and the Proceeds of Crime Act has never really been about um, compensation per se, and although, uh, although there are remedies that are available. So I think the, the, the first aspect of it is that it, it um, is a, a, an aspect of it, and that the settlement essentially in some form of civil proceedings and indeed it applies also to, to your last question and Amanda's answer uh, civil recovery civil recovery doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a complete alternative to part two confiscation proceedings as is emphasized by the passage that I recited from uh, subsection two, uh, section 2a of the act which first absolutely in part one identifies the primacy of criminal prosecutions. Well, if the public perceptions is the problem, why don't we address public perceptions? I've mentioned the Serco and the G4S cases, but another set of cases that keeps coming up is in relating, relation to the banking crisis, and in particular, the manipulation of benchmarks, LIBOR and so on. And people talk about, well, why weren't banks prosecuted for that? Well, they weren't prosecuted, but they were all fined huge amounts of money by the, what is now the FCA, over a billion pounds in total. If the problem is public perception, why don't we make it clear these companies aren't being prosecuted, they're being hammered in the regulatory courts, the regulatory system? Well, um, regrettably, those sorts of outcomes don't appear to have uh, reduced the uh, frequency with which such orders are made. And um, although it may be a council of, perf of perfection, in particular, given the uh, lack of resources uh, that are available, uh, it does seem to me that there is uh, and continues to be merit in the public prosecution of whether it be um, natural defendants, people or companies that have broken the law. And, th and that isn't um, the same as there simply being some other remedy, whether it be compensatory um, or regulatory. David, can I come in on that? Because, because I, I, I disagree. I think the really important thing here, um, Martin smiles, we disagree a lot. Um, the really important thing here is, is actually it, to work out what it is you're trying to achieve. If what you're trying to achieve is the removal of benefit and the um, sanctioning of um, conduct, then why not do it in a way that's actually capable of a result quickly and efficiently? 
And as you say, if I may say so, change public perceptions, perhaps by better reporting of what is and understanding by the public of what is going on. Well, let me put that, sorry, let me put that to, uh, to Max and Martin. And in particular, your point, Amanda, saying why not focus on the individuals committing the crimes and then remove the benefit through civil orders, account freezing orders, what have you, or some other means from the companies. Uh, if fraud, the prevalence of fraud is the justification for this, why not focus on the individuals committing the frauds? Um, uh, Max and Martin. I, I suppose the, the first answer is that the, the, the statutory model and the principles behind it, which are designed to allow us to get to the individuals, uh, aren't working. Uh, and, you know, we all know what happened in Barclays. We all know how defective the identification principle is. And you know, rather lining up to one of the, some of the things that Martin has said, it is giving a pretty powerful impression that above a certain level, there's something akin to criminal immunity in, in the corporate model, where we can continue at lower levels to isolate and to prosecute individuals. So that, that's the first thing. The second is, you know, I only have the, the prosecution tools available to me. I, you know, can't speak about the regulatory context, can't speak so much about the civil context. This is an age old conversation that's been going on for over a century, um, which we all used to call the move from boardroom into courtroom. And we know that on a restraint of trade basis, there is enormous nervousness around taking that step. We look across to the states and we see the Sherman Act, whatever that was, almost 130 years ago, where they made that leap. Uh, somebody said, forgive me who it was, we don't want a US style vicarious liability model. I absolutely agree with that, but the, the ceiling hasn't caved in in the States um, ever since 1895. So there, there's got to be a way of, of doing this. And I do agree with Martin that uh, it's not all about the perception. Of course, it's about the money. But if you bring the two together, removing the benefits of crime and making sure that you effectively identify all of the culprits for that criminality, then you will turn public perception. And I think the question we're asking tonight is, can you do that without any corporate liability model? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm suggesting that where we've already got a model in certain areas of activity, uh, shouldn't we look at, at stretching and expanding that with the appropriate safeguards? Let me ask you this about the relationship between individual and corporate liability. We've been told in other contexts that as prosecutors and investigators in these big cases, time is at a premium. You're already perhaps some years away from the offences. The trial is some, year in the, some years in the future, and you have to decide how to focus your investigation, what, def what suspects to include and what to exclude from your inquiry in order to have a manageable case. Now, the more resources that you focus on potential corporate defendants, surely it follows the less resources that are focused on individual suspects. Can I, um, can I jump in just ahead of Max, who, who might otherwise be uh, embarrassed in, in having to answer the question? Uh, it seems to me that uh, the, the first principle in relation to a failure to prevent offence is, is to identify an offence that has been committed that then the company may have failed to prevent. So the focus is always in the criminal investigation is going to be on that first step, namely, is there an individual or collection of a group of individuals who have committed the fraud offence or the bribery offence, if it's a bribery act um, prosecution. The, um, the fact that there is a failure or maybe a failure to prevent offence doesn't mean that the focus is, is going to shift or not shift substantially or to put in uh, to adopt your um, phraseology, that the resource is going to be shifted to a corporate investigation, because the corporate investigation will itself develop from a, 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 an idea or consideration of the evidence in relation to the context in which the uh, in which the uh, offence itself, the substantive offence, will uh, or was committed. So I think it's going to be secondary rather than pri primary, and I don't think it is going particularly to drain resources or mean that somehow the focus shifts. That what I suspect it would mean is that in a context, for example, as I indicated uh, in my talk, uh, the context of a fraud committed uh, through, the, uh, through a corporate vehicle, then it's going to be an automatic part of the investigation once the 
underlying or predicate offence is identified to see whether that has happened with uh, as a result of a failure to prevent. Well, is it, Martin? I mean, it's different points, isn't it? Was the fraud committed? Were the people involved dishonest? Who uh, knew about the fraud? And did the company have sufficient protocols to guard against fraud? Were they in compliance with government guidance as applied to a company in that situation and as the guidance applied at the time? Don't we risk juries and criminal trials having to deal with a whole new raft of issues on top of what they already have to deal with? I think so far as juries are concerned, probably not. But in terms of resources, um, I think that would be putting the cart, and literally putting the cart before the horse. You, would, you wouldn't start devoting either resources or tiring a jury with these issues until you've already established that there's a pr the primary offence is committed. And, I, and one can well envisage that companies might be, um, and others, um, Amanda and others may have a, a, a clearer view of this, but the, the company wouldn't automatically be prosecuted in the same trial, I shouldn't have thought. Uh, so potentially two criminal trials then? Maybe. Well, that's just talking about criminal trials and juries then for a moment of a dividing line between us is or between the parties is, is the civil side against using the criminal side. Juries may be best placed to decide issues of dishonesty, but are juries best placed to decide whether a company's procedures complied or were reasonable in the circumstances of government guidance and the prevailing circumstances? Are juries best placed to make those decisions? Uh, Martin and Max. We leave that one to Max. Well, let me speak in, in defence of juries. Uh, I mean, we, I, I expect all of us speakers and participants know that it can be a real challenge to deliver in court the complexity of um, a corporate structure, leave alone the activities that you're trying to describe on an indictment, uh, whether against individuals or, or bodies corporate. But that, of course, is the task of the, of the legal uh, professions. It's the task of the judiciary. The um, cornerstone of it is to set legal principles that are susceptible to being explained and understood by ordinary people. And uh, reasonableness uh, is a key word here, isn't, isn't it? Uh, and that is not a, it's not a corporate term, um, but taking of reasonable steps, i.e. in the context of whatever business was being carried out, um, should be something that is capable of being explained to a jury. So um, to piggyback on what Martin was saying, the key here is to set your case strategy at the very outset to ensure that you are capturing uh, every aspect of the criminality in question. Uh, at the moment, we are able um, to do that through the current statutory uh, regimes, uh, but we know there are limitations uh, on it. Um, I see the dividing line between uh, the argument that you leave anything corporate to civil recovery and anything individual goes to criminal recovery. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, that is sustainable in uh, the long term. I mean, you have to accept that I'm the head of the Crown Prosecution Service, so I'm interested in prosecuting. Um, there are other authorities who don't um, prosecute. Um, Let me um, put it another way. Are you yeah. interested in the Crown Prosecution Service taking on what might be a quasi-regulatory role assessing the reasonableness of a company's procedures in relation to the fraud and so on and so forth, as opposed to prose prosecuting people for committing fraud. And, and, and obviously the answer is, is the latter. You know, we're interested in doing what, what we know and not in crossing over into, into other territory. Um, it is true that um, civil powers are, as a generality, being more increasingly used uh, both by us as prosecutors and indeed by investigators. Look at the uh, National Crime Agency, unexplained wealth orders, etc. So I think that there is some crossing of, of the line there. But of course, I'm not arguing for us to become uh, an enforcement regulatory uh, agency or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, Amanda. Sorry, sorry, I just wanted to say, actually, in one sense, um, the, the question is, is, as it were, back to front, because it, it, if it's assuming that corporates should only be um, or shouldn't be dealt with by juries. And I think what at least three, are, uh, or well, I don't know about Martin, actually, but I, I, certainly I think men, many people on this uh, call would think that juries are the right um, way to decide serious criminal cases. Um, and so actually 
from my perspective, it's not about whether a jury can or, or should, it's about whether or not the, the whole uh, organization of um, penalizing corporates uh, for this type of conduct should in itself be made uh, criminal in, in the traditional sense or whether actually it serves society better to have a different route. And I suspect, as, as Max has said, that's not the, that would not be for the Crown Prosecution Service. If, if it went down the regulatory route, that would not be for the Crown Prosecution Service to deal with. But I think well, there me... is a practical point as well, if I may say so, which is that if, if um, Max is uh, looking at the corporate and the individual, um, how does Max get the uh, enormous swathes of material from the corporate, which it then uses against the corporate in a criminal prosecution? That, that in itself is um, potentially slightly fraught and not a problem that the regulator has. Well, remember that's just on that narrow point, um, once the predicate offence is committed in the relevant corporate context, then it's for the effectively FTP, it's a misnomer because it's it's a defence if it can show that it had adequate procedures to prevent the offence. So in terms of disclosure, there would be a there would be um, an incentive for the company to be producing material and evidence to demonstrate that it had in place reasonable procedures to uh, prevent the offence from happening. That's true, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be in its interest, would it, to demonstrate that its uh, employee had committed uh, a fraud and thereby give the material to the prosecutor that, that that's a concern to me i don't think that i don't think that's a departure from the current um, state of affairs where uh, where the doctrine of identification means that depending upon who that person is it might be liable to prosecution anyway you're right of course if it's a lowly employee who, who let, could be the bmw let me interject on this if i may um, Amanda and Catherine, what sort of message does it send to executives such as John Harrison, who spoke to us earlier in this series of webinars, who say, I want to persuade my board of the importance of having a compliance system, of having a sophisticated system within our company to make sure that people don't commit crimes on our behalf? What message does it send to them if we say we're not going to introduce such failure to prevent offences? Uh, to Amanda and Catherine. Um, well, uh, if I, I'll go first, I think I don't think that um, the, the the existence of a, a criminal offence is the only way to persuade the board of the importance of proper corporate governance in relation to potential frauds. Um, as we've heard and discussed already, you know the potential for significant fines. Um, where there is kind of um, you know, failings by the company um, is okay, not the same as a criminal offence, but it is persuasive. And there's the added bonus that an effectively run company um, works better. And those are two things that are not insignificant when you're explaining to the board why it is imperative that you have in place proper corporate governance procedures. Can I, can I just come in there? I, I absolutely see what, what Catherine is, is saying, but I think the, the pressure behind your question, David, is, is this. If we go back to the identification principle in a small corporate structure or even a mid-sized corporate structure, the identification principle, which is, if you like, already on the statute book, essentially works. You're not going to have the difficulty that you did in the much larger multinational structure, whether Barclays or anywhere else. So. Um, what are we going to do? Are we going to remove the identification principle and, and, and remove the burden from small and medium sized entities? Or are we going to say this is where we are? Uh, we need something more effective to get to the, the, the gravamen of the offending. And the only way to do that is to expand um, failure to prevent in a proportionate way with, as Martin says, the reverse burden that makes it in the corporate's interest to demonstrate why they should not be prosecuted, or if they are, why they have taken reasonable steps. Uh, my concern is we've got a bit of a two-stage approach at the moment with the existing identification principle. Don't we need to level that up? Well, let me, let's talk about that, uh, that, topic that topic of leveling up though, because is there a danger that the failure to prevent offences that we're talking about might also disproportionately affect 
smaller companies. Take a company with a handful of employees, perhaps an owner manager who's also working on the front line. And we were told by Professor Horde the majority of companies in the UK are smaller, even one man band affairs. Now those small kind of companies uh, that perhaps omit to do a risk assessment or don't update their risk assessment, assessment regularly or forget to do spot checks, the kind of thing that big companies can afford to pay outside contractors for them to ensure they don't miss that, aren't those small companies going to be essentially sitting ducks for what are in essence strict liability criminal offences, but with the provisor, or the defence that we've described? I think the real the real problem here is resources. And um, uh, I, I believe that uh, you won't have a company that has anti-bribery procedures that is completely disregarding um, the possibility of fraud uh, in in its corporation. It's, that's just not how people operate. So uh, to my mind that there is a real problem um, potentially with SMEs having an undue burden uh, and being just much less prepared to be able to operate it for, for the sorts of reasons, David, that you're saying that it's coming down to a you know, a, a low, a low level of um, in the pecking order of what's keeping the company going. And and well, funnily enough, after a pandemic, it's even more, uh, more of an issue, I think. Uh, well, let me let me put the, the other side of it to, the, to you then, Amanda, since uh, uh, you've come in. What about the argument that all that's been asked of companies is essentially to try and identify risks to their company, risks of their employees doing something seriously wrong that they shouldn't do? which even if it wasn't a crime would be a serious uh, civil liability for the company. That's what they've been asked to do in effect. To what extent is, is that an additional burden on them? Well, it is an additional burden. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's, it can be one that isn't compartmentalised and ought to. I mean, if what we're really trying to do is change corporate behaviour, then what we need to do is to put it, uh, embed it in all companies um, right the way through. And it shouldn't be limited to fraud or a pocket of bribery or a, a pocket of tax evasion. It should be the way in which the companies are, are run entirely. So for, for my for my part, I think it's it's an obvious thing to try to instruct people or, or guide them on how good companies are run, uh, but not um, to put them in the firing line for a criminal offence. And all of the frankly, all of the expense of defending a criminal offence with absolutely no chance of getting any money back whatsoever from the government if you are, as it happens, wrongly convicted or yet wrongly prosecuted or you're acquitted. Um, Amanda, I, I mean, I, I absolutely see the argument for wider corporate education and I have no role in that. Uh, CPS doesn't seek one. And there's um, a great deal that can be done, you know, year on year to make sure that we have corporate behaviour that, that, you know, frankly, the country would expect public interest and all the rest of it. But I think on, on the expansion of failure to prevent, we are not talking about uh, criminal prosecution flowing from multiple aspects of poor corporate behaviour. We're talking about a criminal investigation and prosecution for serious criminal offending, um, fraud, uh, money laundering and false accounting. And they are identifiable, serious criminal harms, which I think for the sake of this conversation, we should be able to agree are matters, never mind the wider corporate education, which any entity, big, medium or small, should be required to take moderate steps. You know, I come back to the word reasonable and it shouldn't be beyond the wit of anyone, because after all, it's incumbent on every individual not to commit the offence of false accounting. Uh, we're just saying that that should also permeate at corporate levels as well. Um, but it has to be complementary with everything else, both with existing crime models and with the wider non-criminal uh, aspects of corporate behaviour. But I, you know, I, I don't buy the notion that by any form of levelling up, we are suddenly bringing, if you like, all boardroom activity into the courtroom. That, that's, I don't think that's what anyone is suggesting. It's much more restricted than that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that. What I'm, what I'm actually saying is um, the way in which you sanction it doesn't have to be the heavy handed criminal prosecution. It can be dealt with and all of, all of the correcting guidance 
uh, and better education and ways of operating can be done in a way which doesn't cause such enormous expense uh, to companies. I think I've got a time for about two more questions. So let me just touch on DPAs since I haven't uh, mentioned those. Is there a danger that DPAs discriminate against small companies? Of the 10 DPAs that we've had so far, none have involved a financial imposition of less than two million pounds. Yet we understand that about there's about 5,000 corporate prosecutions uh, per year. Why aren't small companies who perhaps also would like to avoid criminal convictions uh, entering into DPAs with prosecutors? I mean, it's a slightly difficult question for me to answer because we haven't had any. <laughs> and I, you know, let me say we, we continue to look for a suitable case to apply the DPA, but obviously the, the real expertise there is held in the, in the SFO who uniquely have been able to operate the regime. Um, what we find is that the, the problems associated with prosecuting a corporate entity and the problems associated with the um, identification doctrine make it uh, much more difficult um, or they reduce the opportunities for us to even consider a DPA. Um, and, and that includes the very limited applicability of the failure to prevent um, offence. Uh, there are other aspects to it, of course, and, and I, I, I think Again, I defer to SFO expertise here, but you need for a DPA to have uh, something akin to uh, an equality of arms between the prosecution and defence um, for, frankly, all of the preparatory work that needs to go into um, coming to a court with a view to presenting a potential DPA. That, that is why I think at the level that the SFO investigate and prosecute, they've had some uh, success. That doesn't tend to apply to the cases that we've looked at, but, uh, you know, it doesn't mean we're, we're not still looking for applying, at least even under the existing rules, um, for a potential DPA in the future. I think final qu question. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm on an echo again. Final question from me. What, what is the argument against the CPS or someone else using civil powers against these companies? We've seen in America the Department of Justice has a right of action, a civil claim against a company who's uh, employee commits uh, a criminal offence on its behalf in respect of certain um, crimes. Would the CPS or would the FCA or another prosecutor, another body, be well placed to take such civil actions against companies alongside criminal actions against individuals? And I say that's outside the identification principle. Uh, if you're coming to me, David, I, 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 I'm not arguing for that. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a future uh, for the criminal prosecuting authority to uh, absorb a twin track approach. Um, the FCA does what it does and should continue doing what it does. And it's not necessary to bring it all under one uh, roof in order to intercede at, at regulatory, civil and criminal levels. So. Uh, I'm definitely not arguing uh, for that. Uh, as Martin observed, difficult for me to say much about resources. I, I, I'm grateful for the chairman of the bar last year making uh, two or three bids this evening for increased resource for the CPS. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and obviously uh, that's, that's uh, well received. But um, we're just looking at this on the basis of principle. The principle here is that we want to use effective prosecution, criminal prosecution tools, no more than that. Having said that, of course, and you know, Martin's a specialist here, we are actively engaged in uh, criminal recovery and to, to a degree civil, civil powers can be used here when it comes to the proceeds of crime. And we, as everybody knows, have our own proceeds of crime division uh, who do successfully remove the, the benefits of crime in the, the tens and hundreds of, uh, of millions. But um, it would be another model entirely if we were to take on a twin track civil criminal approach across the board here. Well, I think well, I'd better bring things to an end there. Thank you all so much uh, for your time and for answering those questions. If I can hand over to Professor Sarah Green for some final uh, closing remarks. Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody, um, to our panellists and to everybody who uh, has submitted questions. Uh, I think you all agree that was a very interesting debate and one that could probably have gone on a lot longer uh, if we had the time. Um, we did in fact build this event um, as one that attempted to offer some conclusions as regards corporate criminal liability, but that was maybe too much to hope for in an hour. 
but we did of course have um, an excellent summation of some of the principal issues and arguments and we're very grateful. So during the course of all of these webinars, we've heard now seven weeks of evidence from 29 expert witnesses. Um, but now comes the most important part of the exercise and it's time for you, the experts and practitioners who have joined us to retire to consider your verdict. Um, there's no pressure of time, but unless you respond by the 31st of August, our consultation will close and we'll have to start all over again. Um, so if you're interested in this area of law and if hopefully you've enjoyed these webinars or the contents of our discussion paper, we would very much appreciate your comments either by email to ccl at lawcommission.gov.uk or on our Corporate Criminal Liability Citizen Space webpage. Um, as uh, Professor Lewis said at the start, if you just type Law Commission um, Corporate Criminal Liability Consultation, into your search engine, it will take you um, straight to that page. When you get there, the only details you need to enter are your name and the capacity in which you are responding. There are 13 questions. There's no expectation that you answer them all. Um, and you don't even have to put your email address in unless you want a confirmation. We'd rather hear from you on the bits that you're interested in and the bits that you feel you know about rather than not hear from you at all. Please don't be put off by the number of questions or the fact that there might be questions that you don't want to answer, that's absolutely fine. Um, and all of these responses are crucial in determining the contents of the options paper that we present to government in December. Um, I'm sure you will probably know how we work, but for those of you um, who don't, the Law Commission uh, is a highly consultative body. Um, we don't profess to have expertise in all of the fields in which we undertake projects. We look into an area and we assimilate the views and experience of the people we speak to, which is why we're so very grateful for um, people giving their time to events uh, like that one this afternoon. Um, all of these events so far, apart from the second one, have been recorded and they'll be available shortly on the Law Commission Corporate Criminal Liability website, um, subject to any outstanding consents being obtained. And so finally, um, I know we've run slightly over, uh, but all that remains is for me to thank again our hosts, 30, 33 Chancery Lane and Kingsley Napley, our panellists Amanda Pinto QC, Martin Evans QC, Catherine Tyler, the CPS, and in particular the Director of Public Prosecutions for their support, all of our hosts and participants in this series of events, and of course to everybody listening. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoons and evenings. Thank you.